morning, everyone. Today is August 4th, 2022, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every week, Jean Lawler, Natalie, Sarah Agamiri, and I bring you another cutting edge webinar on negotiation and communication, topics of interest to mediators, arbitrators, lawyers and really anybody who communicates and negotiates as part of their daily routine. There's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you like what you see. And over the past two and a half years, our audiences have been so generous with contributions to food banks in honor of our great speakers. One of our favorite parts of the program every week is announcing the running total of contributions to date of which we're aware made by our generous audiences. Jean, would you do the honors, please? Good day, everyone. Yes, our running total as of today, and it really jumped after last week, $304,702.70, as in seven zero cents. Fantastic. Wow. Lots, of, lots of meals. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much to our generous audiences and our wonderful speakers for inspiring these contributions. Today, we have another extraordinary speaker to present to you. That's Jim Brosnahan, Senior of Counsel at Morrison and Forster LLP in San Francisco. There are not enough superlatives to describe Jim and his career, his accomplishments, and his reputation, not only in California, but beyond. To say that he's a lion of the trial bar doesn't do justice to it. To say that he's a legend in his own time <laughs> barely scratches the surface. So many people are listening. You all know who Jim Brosnahan is and his extraordinary accomplishments. There truly is not much need for further introduction. Jim, we're so happy you're here. Thank you so much for supporting the Will Work for, Work for Food Project. Please tell us a little bit about the food bank where you'd like people to direct contributions if they're in a position to do so. And then tell us about negotiations, settlements, compromises, and civil and criminal cases. We can't wait. The floor is yours. I, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to be here just to have a chance to uh, help a little bit and to see all of you. Good morning, everybody. I understand you're in not only the United States, but you're around the world. And uh, that doesn't intimidate me. I, I taught at Berkeley Law for 10 years, and I had LLM students from all over, and, and uh, we had a good time. The, the food bank is special to my wife, Carol, and I because it was at least 40 years ago that I tried a criminal case for two men who ran a food bank in Oakland, which is what we're talking about here. It's not the same food bank, but in order to defend the case, by the way, there were no negotiations. Uh, the prosecutor was uh, righteous and uh, was going to crush these defendants. To defend it, we put on 27 people who had gotten food at the food bank. And the jury was moved because it wasn't an abstract idea. It wasn't uh, a generality. These were people who were dependent on the food that came from the defendant's food bank. One of them, by the way, uh, we ran the witnesses through out of the witness room and there wasn't always complete time to prepare. And I wasn't quite ready on this particular witness. And I said, what's your occupation? He said, I'm a drug dealer. So uh, that was not my highest moment. Don't turn off the program. I, it gets better as we go along. All right. So, um, uh, the food bank is something that my wife and I have made modest contributions to over the years. Uh, it it is in there's an enormous need, and as a trial lawyer, I can describe the situation. There's, in the United States, one in four people sense a, a hunger issue in the course of the day. One in four. In Oakland, they do have the structure to try to feed as many people as possible. Anything that you would give, whether small, medium, or large amount in this program, will go directly to vegetables, 
to food, to some meat that will be eaten by someone that you will never know, individuals never be able to thank you, but you will feel good if you do it. So our main subject is negotiations. And what interests me about this subject is that it's situational. That is to say, you have to deal with what's happening in front of you at any given moment. And for me to uh, tell you, you should do this, you should do that, you have to weigh that a little bit because it depends on what's going on in the, in the situation. Um, the, uh, there are no rules. There are no rules. And then I'm gonna give you some rules. I give you one rule. Uh, always get your authority in writing. Always get your authority in writing. That That's as close to a rule. But what I mean is situational. There you are. You're in, you might be in the courthouse hallway. They're making an offer of some kind. And what are you going to do about it? What are you going to say? And by the way, what are you going to look like? What is the sound of your voice going to be? Uh, will you be able to disguise the fantastic eagerness you have to take the amount of money that they just offered you, if it is money? And we will talk about what the client needs. And that's my first uh, start is with the client. We'll go from that to the opponent. We'll go from that to the mediator. and We'll go from that to the judge. I'll give you five things for each of these people to think about, at least. First of all, what does the client want? Of course, that's what you would ask. Are they able to tell you what they want? Um, are they competent to tell you what they want? Um, have they thought about what they want? Are they a passive person that's relying on you to tell them what they want? Number two, uh, do you overpromise to get the case? Uh, I have violated every one of these suggestions, all of them, over the years. Okay, so let me not pretend that I haven't done it because there are cases uh, that really are very exciting. But do you overpromise? And I would imagine that some of the advertising, I'm in favor of advertising because it puts information in the hands of clients and that's a good thing. But uh, if, they, if the ad makes it sound easy, then would they come in with that feeling? And have you promised that you can do this and you can do that? Because if you do, you're setting yourself up for a problem later on when you explain that really the case is not worth that much. So not, number two is do not overpromise in the beginning. Number three is a more specific discussion of client difficulties. And you, you know all this. Uh, one in 10 in the United States are, have some mental illness. It may be a compulsion. It, it, it may be uh, a feeling that they're being picked upon when really they're not being picked upon. So what do you do about the men and all the way to schizophrenia? Some lawyers deal with people who are schizophrenic. I, I thought many times during the practice of law that I wish I had more time to master each of the mental illness categories. I did have a number of cases that involved mental illness. And that complicates it because where we're going with the client is to figure out exactly what they want and try to get them what they want. Uh, do they have other issues? For example, suppose it's a corporation. Um, were the people that you're dealing with involved in the original transaction that gave rise to this lawsuit for a billion and a half dollars. Um, that's, that's an issue. You have to deal with that in some way because the authority you get to settle has to come from the right people. 
And that's difficult. And there's nothing easy about it. A general counsel who approved the original transaction, the last thing that person may want is for it to go upstairs somewhere. And he wants or she wants to settle it and let it all go away. Is the, is, will there be repercussions, for example, from the corporation? What about insurance companies? Um, insurance companies are very sophisticated. They handle this section of the insurance policy over and over again. Uh, they, for the most part, very sophisticated about it. And they are very careful with money. And uh, I remember a, a case where it was the 3rd of July and I wanted to go to Lake Tahoe. I'm gonna to sell this case. We were at $2,387 or something. And he said, well, why don't you go to $2,921 or something? And I wondered, why did I go to law school? What, what was my idea? How, how did this happen? Um, and uh, I won't give you the name of the company, but um, those of you who uh, represent insurance companies may be quite familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, what, what are the other problems with settling this case? Uh, what, what about the situation at home with the spouse? Um, is, is it gonna be an admission? Uh, uh, I, my favorite of these cases were today, John Jones uh, paid $2,600,000 without an admission of liability. Okay, but doesn't that make you suspicious? What about the licenses? A doctor, it's a malpractice case, let's say. What's going to happen? You know all this. You have to go to school on what's going to happen. If you don't know that, you have you need to find somebody to talk to about what's going to happen with this and what's going to happen right here in this location, my case, San Francisco. What, what's, what are the, these authorities going to do with my client? The implications of settlement. So we expand our view and it takes time. And I'll in the end, I'll give you a, an idea about, about that. It, it takes it takes the time, and truly, I would sometimes be focused on the money, uh, the money. And I had a client one time tell me after we had a very successful resolution. He said, "Well, you won, but I didn't." I, and that's that was an interesting statement, wasn't it? Our state of mind uh, is very interesting. So that's. Um, Looking at the client is something that you do in detail and get ready. The implications of it is number four. And number five is always get it in writing. I believe I mentioned that before. Always get it in writing. You can't do that right away. And in, in the criminal area, this is mostly about civil today, but in the criminal area, uh, they... Uh, very often will postpone from the first session with their client a full discussion of the merits, which, of course, the client wants to tell you all about how they were outraged and it was terrible and uh, all that kind of stuff. The reason that criminal lawyers do it, and maybe we have some criminal lawyers uh, here, they don't want to be lied to in the first session. It's messy. Then you have to overcome that all. You have to cross-examine them. You have to do all those things. So get it in writing. Now, I've, I've been in courthouses in California where the plaintiff, I'd be defending, the plaintiff's lawyer uh, would, have a, would have a form. And he would get the client and he'd say, we've been offered this amount. You have told me you don't want to take that amount. Sign here. There's something uh, interesting that goes on psychologically at that point. They're turning down, in the old days, $7,800. And it's a little bit like one of these shows uh, that on TV, you know, let's make a deal. And they're turning it down. But the lawyer for self-protection has 
that in the file, no matter what. Uh, similarly, uh, on the criminal side, uh, it, it doesn't hurt to do that sometimes, although the criminal lawyers are careful uh, about putting things in writing and, and you can't blame them. In the United States, we have an unending series of settlement meetings designed to prevent trials. As you might have guessed, I grew up in a time when we went to trial a lot. Uh, and now there's discussions and uh, we have the mediator. First of all, I find researching the mediator long, tedious process. Uh, what do they do? Uh, what are they like? How long have they been doing it? Oh, they've been doing this for 47 years. How interesting. I hope they don't fall asleep. Uh, I mean, I can say that I'm a man of maturity, let's, I, that's the way I want to put it, okay. So what, what is it about this person? Um, what, what, are, what are their techniques? And we'll cover some of those. Um, what's their personality? Um, what, what are they like? And then you get very personal. Where do they get their business? Do they get two thirds of their business from the firm of Sturdley, Sturdley and Sturdley, um, at which you are facing in this case. Uh, call me cynical, suspicious. I'm not sure unless the person, which happens a lot, is quite uh, known as an objective person, that's good. What do they know about trials? in a society where there are fewer and fewer trials. There was a uh, settlement judge in Long Beach, California many years ago. He tried a lot of cases, but he also sat in settlement. He knew what the cases were worth. It was almost eerie that he could tell you after being briefed by both sides, what that case was probably worth with a Long Beach jury. He knew Long Beach juries. He might not know Reading juries or he might not know Bakersfield juries or San Francisco, but he knew those juries. He knew what a case was worth. Well, how does a mediator today look at the, the virus for two and a half years where there were almost no civil juries at all? How does that mediator know what it's worth? So you research uh, really, and I I take too much time, I think, and then now oh, this one is not good, that one is not good. I, yeah, you really have to get down to the bottom of how they feel about these things. Uh, judges who are, become mediators are interesting. Um, and uh, they have written decisions sometimes if they were on the appellate court. And do they, do they show a lot of empathy, which is one of the qualities of a judge, uh, or maybe not? Um, so number two with the, uh, uh, the opponent, and after you research the opponent, maybe you know the opponent, uh, but uh, after you research the opponent, there's a way to start the case that might lead to negotiations and might lead to a settlement. And it was, I was taught this years ago by a very fine lawyer who was a little bit older than I was. And we had a, a libel case and it was in the papers and stuff. And so he came up to me, the, the first court appearance, and he said, you know, Jim, he said, I'm looking forward. I know we'll fight like hell. I understand that. But he said, I'm looking forward to this case. I'm glad to have a case with you. That that struck me in an age of uh, screamers, which we'll get to, uh, that um, it, it set a tone. Uh, I notice at the moment that the Secretary of State of the United States is negotiating the release of some people. I was thinking about this this morning with the Russians. Think about that. What is that like? And uh, it, it, it appears that they may well get it done. But 
uh, how difficult that is. Um, so that's number two with the opponent, the start. And, and civility is not just a nice thing that is good. It's good for the relations that may lead to a resolution in, in the United States, 95% uh, of the civil cases um, settle. They don't get tried. That brings us to number three, the uh, tactics that the mediator might use, which is part of your research um, and part of your procedure. Number, number one, for the lawyer uh, first and on number three, Never mention a number unless you're ready to pay it. So you want to avoid conditional kinds of things, kind of, well, no matter how you phrase it, I might be able to possibly get to 300000 I, I mean, I really don't. Bang, door closed. That's it. You will never resolve that case for less than $300,000. So this is not a casual conversation that we're having with a friend. This is uh, hard-edged negotiations. Number two, find out what they want. I didn't always do that. What do they need? What do they need to settle a case? What's possible for them? Now, some of the things your, oppo your opponent tells you will not necessarily be true, whatever, you can assess all that. But what does that person need in order to settle it? You're not going to just give it to them, but you, at least you're going to put it in context. You're going to understand uh, what, uh, what it could be. Now, another part of the tactics of the dealing with the opponent is to think of an alternative. I'll give you a typical example in a libel case where, uh, and, and I used to defend libel cases. Um, the point is that that plaintiff suffered an injury to their self image. And those, those feelings are real very often. They, they were accused of something and it was public. And it was in the, on the TV, it was in the paper, whatever. Widely dispersed, can you imagine what that's like? Um, very often what they really want is a retraction and a uh, apology. That, that might not eliminate the need for money, but it might reduce it. On the other hand, Press people never want to do that. They, they just don't want to do that. Very tough-minded with regard to that. Think about what was in the paper this morning uh, and, and what people were named and what people were hurt uh, by, by those uh, statements uh, and, and see how different it is. But my point is there are alternatives to money. And in fact, Given the breadth of the audience here, there's all kinds of things that may be involved in your cases. There may be a stay away order and you're trying to negotiate it, by which I mean, let's say the husband has been charged with abusive conduct and you want to get a stay away order. Well, like a, one case in the U.S. Supreme Court, this term He's got all his tools in the garage. He can't move his tools. He doesn't have a place. He has a place to stay, but it doesn't accommodate all his tools. And that's what he does. I mean, that's his hobby or that might be his occupation or something. Can he come there? Can he do any work there? No, yes, back and forth. All of these things, you know, are responsive to trying to get what your client wants, which is a stay away order out of the house. He cannot come in to the house, but he can go into the garage if the following things are true. One, he gives notice of at least one hour. So let's say the spouse can leave and so forth and so on. Uh, my point is 
look for things other than money. Uh, money is, is interesting, but it, it really solves the problem. Um, the fourth point on the opponent is what's your timing? Uh, are you going to try to settle this case right out of the bat early? Are you going to um, settle it with the mediator? Are you going to settle it um, with just the opponent? I mean, maybe you could, maybe you know this person. You just, mm -hmm. we can just settle it, save a lot of money. That would be good. Are you going to try to settle it when you get to the courthouse because you know the procedures will allow for more mediation by one of the judges? Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, when are you going to settle it? What you don't want to do is get knocked around so that you constantly, this may be the defense aspect of it, but I think it applies to plaintiffs too. You don't want to make compromises only to be, and this is very common, to be in another meeting with another person talking about the same case, and now they want to reduce for them to succeed, we'll talk about that. They need to reduce this number that you already published before. So what are you gonna do with this? In that connection, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, something that some of the young lawyers don't think about. Are you gonna take this case to trial? Is, it, is this a trial case, really? Um, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Here's uh, number five on the opponent is an exotic concept that I am fixated on, and it has to do with the voice. And I started years ago uh, teaching trial lawyers about the voice. There's a lot to it. There's books on voice, um, and but. It's amazing to me how important it is. My only point here is um, listen to the voice of your opponent. Watch the mannerisms of your opponent. Is there a pause when you say 800,000? Does that mean you're close? And the voice, i give you an extreme example from the criminal field uh, about the voice. <laughs> My client served 17 years for a, an arson murder that did, was not arson and he didn't commit it. And um, we were getting ready for a trial because the federal judge had ordered a trial, I'll keep this short. And, um, the district attorney out in the valley in California was very righteous, uh, yelling at me and everybody, this is outrage and terrible. This woman died and her two children died in a fire, which was true. And um, that was it. And, you know, you come down here and then he threw in, you're, you're from a big firm and, you know, you think you're going to come down to our town and you're going to do this. It's just constant and so forth. And then one day um, we were talking and he said, how are you today? And uh, I thought he's going to fold. Um, and he did. Uh, because he couldn't try the case. He didn't, his stuff had been excluded. It wasn't really a good case in uh, 17 years before. And all of a sudden, it's like this man who's been yelling at me now for six weeks wants to be my friend. Uh, gee, what does that mean? And uh, the client walked out of the jail about uh, seven, eight days later. Uh, what's the sound of the voice of your opponent? I, I believe in this stuff. Uh, it came from teaching voice to listening to voices. And there are voices that, that they just can't control. It comes from the emotions. It comes from the relief. 
uh, from a lot of things. Um, that brings us to the mediators. And I know we have some. We have Jeff, who's an ace mediator. So forgive me if I speak with candor with regard to mediators. And I've got five things to think about. First, I mentioned already the research that's necessary, and that's that's number one. But now you have the mediator. Number two, what is their energy level with regard to doing it? Because it makes all the difference. I hate to tell you how many times I've been surprised one way or the other about how hard they were going to work. These are real examples. Uh, in the mediation, we spend the whole day, we don't resolve the case. And this former judge, who's very good, but who had been doing all this law stuff for a long time, said, well, we can't do it. I'm sending it back. And that's what happened. So we we ended up trying the case in that case. Well, if you want it settled, then you need to know this person and, and all of that. I'll give you a, a stark example of, of a, a mediator who's on the young side. This is a young mediator. I've gone down to uh, the plaintiff's uh, office with 15 cases. And we have have a nice chat, great lawyer, and we're going to, we're going to try to sell some of them. Maybe try one or two, but we're going to sell the other ones. And so uh, we're negotiating and we're posturing, and we're arguing. This is an outrage just because the man lost the leg. You know, you want all this money and stuff. But the things you say in mediation, are, and we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, my my Jesuit teachers at Boston College would would not think they were appropriate, uh, you know. But that's what you say. I mean, so we're going along. We can never do this and so on. The mediator then said, "Obviously, we're not going to be able to negotiate these cases. We're not going to be able to settle them." We both looked at her like she was out of her mind. And we both said almost together, that's not correct, you know. <laughs> and we kept going and we settled, not 15, but we settled, let's say, 12. Um, so the mediator is, um, uh, is uh, do they have the edgy current feeling about uh, how to do this? Uh, what are the, the mediator's methods? And I have seen some really good ones that mediators use in a case that we had gotten to a point where we weren't going to settle. There's, there's too much distance. The experienced mediator, a former judge, said, uh, well, we, we can try one thing if you want to, but it's up to you. Uh, you, you Brosnahan, will give me a number which is really your best number. They don't, you know, this is it. They take it, they don't take it. Give me that number. To the other side, give me your best number. And this will be, you write it on paper, each of you, give it to me. And I'm telling you right now that if those two numbers are within Let's make up a number. Within $5,000 of each other, I'm going to split that number in half, and that's going to be the settlement, and you have to agree to that now. Mm, mm, okay. Mm, well, mm, okay. All right. So I put in a number. The other side puts in a number. In fact, it was within his, the judge's number. He divided it in half and the case settled. Now that's innovative. Um, I think probably it's probably taught in mediation school uh, and, and a lot of other things, but uh, do you have a mediator that has those kinds of techniques? On the other extreme is the mediator who is a screamer. 
Uh, these people uh, wander through American uh, judicial exercises, uh, going through bad divorces, uh, frustrated by their life. I don't know what the problem is. But I had a client uh, who was the CEO of a company, and the mediator announced, he said, I want to talk to your client, Brosnahan. I'm going to take him in the other room. Well, is it okay with you? Yeah, it was fine with him. This is an experienced person who handled a lot of things. So he went in there, and uh, pretty soon I can hear through the door screaming. There's screaming going on with my client. Uh, this is malpractice in the extreme, I would say. And the mediator was screaming at my client that he had to settle and do this. And you realize what's going to happen. You're betting the company and blah, 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 blah. Appreciate it. You already know this. They say the same thing in one room that they say in the other, which is you're going to lose. All right. I've studied the case. You're going to lose on one side. You're going to lose on the other. I've never figured it out how both sides could lose. How, how is that possible? But that's what they do. So my client came out and asked me kind of like a civics question. What was that about? He yelled at me, he screamed at me. And we went, two things happened. We went to trial, number one. And number two, I never used that mediator again. Um, th there's no, uh, I couldn't think of a reason why he would do it. This is a very rational client of mine who's open to hearing why he should settle. Um, and so that's number four. Number five, uh, do not fold. Well, of course, you know that, but maybe this is to the younger lawyers in the audience. You can't get pushed around and, you know, Look at the job we have. We step into the middle of other people's problems, right? With the emotions, with the background. The idea, by the way, that corporate clients don't have any emotions in these things is incorrect. That is wrong. They get involved and they want to crush the other side or whatever. But you must not fold. And remind yourself, you have worked on this case for a year and a half. Uh, you know the case. You have impeaching material. You have this, you have that. You have a judge that's kind of favorable to these kind of cases. You can't have the mediator, and, and uh, we'll get to this in a minute with the judge, and we want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to wrap it up quickly here. Um, do not fold. You have to be tough. You have to be tough. And you have to know going in from the client what the amount is that you can do. And you can't do some other. You can't be cowed by uh, an insistent mediator. Now we're in front of the judge. And um, the judge asks, uh, have you tried to settle? There's no good answer to that, num number one. Um, there's no, there's no response that I can think of that's a good answer. I, I just usually put something neutral out there in the air, which is uh, we made effort, both sides made good efforts, but the case has to be tried, something like that. Well, I want you to go down the hall and talk to Judge so-and-so and see if you can settle them. Well, well, sure, okay, we'll go down there, but we, Sound reasonable, we do thing, we wait for the trial. Number number three, uh, again, the research of the judge, you know that. Um, uh, one very young lawyer in, in our office uh, recently was, was one talked to me about their case, but they were about to argue in the court of appeal. I said, who's the judge? And they said, oh, I don't know. That's everything. It's contrary to what you might get out of law school in that law is an objective thing that can be analyzed. But the personality of the judge is everything. From the advocate standpoint, you have to know everything you can find out about the judge. Judge may bring it up again during the trial. 
uh, you know, I don't know why you're fighting. We've been going three weeks. The judge wants to clear the calendar. A lot of judges do that. Some judges don't care about the calendar, but they want to clear the calendar because the presiding judge has four other cases they want to send them. And so cases are settled during the trial. It's not uncommon. A witness testifies and falls apart. Uh, that changes everything. And sometimes the lawyer had no way of knowing about what just happened. So it can settle. It's risky to think that's what I'll do. I'll go to trial and then we'll settle it because the emotions of the lawyers get involved and the idea of winning becomes uh, uh, an attraction to, to the lawyers. Um, the the final point with the judge is to if you want to try the case then you just have to kind of go along with the system but don't you don't settle you just don't settle um and in in my youth my real youth i had 60 files and uh, about 50 of them were personal injury cases and um I go down on eager that I was. Uh, I go down on Saturday instead of playing with the kids. And I would go through some of those. And I'd do that two Saturdays a month or something. And I would pick out the ones I wanted to try. And uh, there was some good evidence in that, or whatever it was. And if I wanted to try a case, this this is... This is a cry from an ancient trial lawyer with, when society was different, frankly. It's very interesting because trial lawyers know about societal changes. But if I want to go to trial, guess what? I was going to go to trial. And mediators, judges, and all that, as polite as I would be, we were going to go to trial. All you have to do in that kind of case is offer no money. Uh, it's done. Final points and then questions. Um, number one, the client's interest is everything. And uh, the lawyer gets involved. I know this. I'm just talking about me and not, not about any of you. But I get involved. I mean, this is the, the emotions of running. The adrenaline is kicked in. By the way, as an aside, adrenaline was my drug of choice. All right, I didn't need anything else. Adrenaline was what it did. If there's a courtroom, client, so forth, then the adrenaline kicks in. And uh, but have I forgotten the client's interest? And and that is central. I know you wouldn't do that. Number two, uh, as an example, a case comes in which is the dream case. Your phone, right? Not. Today, probably an email. Would you be willing to talk to somebody? And a case uh, was described in the papers two weeks ago that uh, I would, today, I would insist on representing this woman who was driving along the fast lane in Texas and she's pregnant. She's pulled over by the, maybe you saw this, she's pulled over by the trooper. And uh, he says, you were going 75 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour zone. I'm going to give you, know, give you a registration plate and something. She said, uh, but, but sir, uh, the law is, uh, I'm pregnant. And the law in Texas is that uh, that's a person. And so there's two of us. Now, I sympathize with the trooper at that point because he was not prepared for this. He had his gun polished. He had his uniform. He was ready for anything, but he wasn't ready for that. I would go to Texas this afternoon to represent that lady. And the problem is that maybe for some good reason, like for example, she's pregnant, she didn't want to go through trial, whatever. Um, and uh, we're all professionals. You balance that. It's a very common situation. I, I know the associates get very disappointed because they really wanted to go to trial. 
but um, the exposure of a billion and a half dollars turned out to be determinative of what should happen. Um, your reputation and credibility, even today with, uh, we have 288,000 lawyers in uh, California, but your reputation floats out there. And what you're doing in these negotiations will be known to other people. Is that really the way you want to be known is, is the question to think about. Learning from your opponents. I learned a lot from watching some great lawyers and how they handle themselves. And so you, there's a little schooling going on there. Uh, two last points, play poker. Play poker. You, you, you probably have enough money to play some kind of poker game. And you sit for three hours on Saturday and you wonder the person that just pushed in all the money, do they really have aces or are they bluffing or what's going on? I can't think of a better way to get ready for negotiations than that. Um, and don't play in the big games though, unless you, you can do them. Okay. And finally a point, I've, I've just, a lot of things you should do. What are the economics of this? Brosnahan is out of control. He's talking about, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to research, you're going to do the whole thing. It's just one case. How do I have the time to do this? Many years ago, I was with uh, the best plaintiff's lawyers that many people thought in Ohio. And he was talking about what he does with experts. And he did this and he did that and he did the other thing. And one of the other panelists said to him, uh, his name was Craig Spangenberg. And uh, Craig uh, was asked uh, by this other panelist, you don't do all that in the small cases. You only do it in the big cases. And I never forgot Craig Spangenberg's answer. He said, if I'm in it, it's a big case. And he wasn't talking about ego. He was talking about when I take a case, I'm going to do what needs to be done. Now, in big firms, that may be a, a type of monetary treason, uh, but it's important. And if you do that, you'll feel good whatever happens you've because you've done your best you know that so we're going to take questions and jeff maybe you're in charge of the yes questions. yeah thank you jim this is pure gold pure gold how we can learn such advanced and complex lessons by focusing back in on the basics it's it's amazing and we thank you for it sure Let me start by asking you about investigation and due diligence on mediators. Do you ever just pick up the phone and call the mediator and say, the other side has suggested you as a potential mediator, I have a few questions. And what sorts of questions do you ask or would you ask mediators? And what kinds of answers would be a thumbs up or thumbs down kind of answer in your mind? My my first reaction is I'm not sure that I have ever done that about the specific case. Uh, I think the other side probably ought to be present. I don't know. I hope I'm not being too uh, iron bound about it, but um, I I I have not done it. I'm sure there are people who have. You know, I, my partner Bob Raven was one of the first in the country to work on alternate dispute resolution. We had long conversations about it. And uh, I, I, you know, a secondary system, um, I wondered about the independence of the mediators and uh, I worried about that kind of thing. I, I don't think I would do it. Uh, I hope I'm not being too... Uh, uh, you know, rigid about it, but uh, I I would not do that. Uh, maybe your question implies that people do it, and 
That's fine. If they're doing it, uh, then I would just say these words. We're going to trial. <laughs> We're going to go to trial. I'm not going to pay a huge amount uh, that doesn't reflect the case. I'm just not going to do it. So let's not waste our time and money. Well, people do have a constitutional right to a jury trial, and it's not, I don't think it's the mediator's job to try to bully people out of that. I, I'm sure you yeah, agree. I agree. Let's let's talk about the screaming mediator. Those people do exist in the marketplace, and the fact that they continue to exist uh, must indicate that there's a following for that sort of work, a clientele. How do you explain that? And what can what can you do to prevent yourself from being in that situation? Or how do you deal with it better if you find yourself unexpectedly in that kind of situation? Yeah, it comes as a surprise very often, no matter how much research you do. You know somebody, you might know them at uh, uh, professional dinners and things, and they used to be, uh, let's say, a magistrate, and now they're doing mediation. And uh, you have no reason to be ready for it. And then all of a sudden it happens. There is an ethos in the mediation business, which is a huge business in the United States, which is, and these are quotes, if you go to trial, you're ruining the legal system as we know it, basically. Excuse me, that, why do we have these courthouses? Uh, I mean, wh why do we have the courtrooms? Uh, wh wh why is that? I don't feel like I'm ruining the system. I might even be helping it, who knows? Um, there's a lot of that, the, the, the guilt trip. Uh, some comes from judges, some from mediators. Um, you have to be impervious to it. Screaming, uh, you know, it's funny. <laughs> a whole generation came through. I think they get the, the young ones are better today than they were 15, 20 years ago. But a whole generation came through screaming. And um, uh, what I learned in some cases was they're afraid to go to trial. They've never been to trial. And they, this is their high point is the scream. And uh, so you just have to. You have to kind of deal with that. Um, I can't imagine, you know, someone looking at me and thinking, now what I really ought to do is scream at Brosnahan, who's an Irish American. Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, and, you know, he's tried oodles of cases and things. I don't, I don't think that's going to work. And let me ask one more question about apology. You talked about the role of people wanting an apology and acknowledgement in media. Yeah. There's a clumsy way to handle it, which doesn't work, which is basically, okay, I apologize. Now will you take less money? That's too, <laughs> that's too transparent. That doesn't work. What are some more artful and diplomatic ways to introduce the concept of an apology or similar concepts into a mediation? Well, I, I think you, you would have kept, if you're defending, you would have kept the money low. And at the right point, when you figured it out, you think you have, you would suggest, what if, and you'd be authorized to say this at that moment, what if, um, this magazine uh, apologized. You know, they do retractions. In fact, the New York Times has a section of retractions every day. Uh, and they could do it. We work on the language uh, because, it, you know, there'd be some balance in the language, but would that, would that, I, we, if we could do that with the amount I offered, then, uh, you want to do that? And sometimes the other lawyer is focused on the money, but the client is, when the client hears that, yes, I would like that. I, I did one or two of those cases um, if the publication was open to it. 
Finally, Jim, we have just a minute or two left. You had so much interesting to say about the voice and being conscious of your voice. Can you give us a couple of tips, do's and don'ts? Yeah. Uh, first of all, take a class on the voice. In my, my students, I, I would have about 20 students at Berkeley Law. Over the 10 year period, uh, about 40% of, these are law students, 40% had some concern about their voice, varying from a slight to really serious. I had a couple of students who had actual difficulty with, with the voice. So I had my daughter, Lisa, come in. She's an opera singer. And she would work with them one-on-one. -on -one. And the stuff that came out, these are law students. So... 35 years ago, I thought it's a matter of time till every law school has voice as a semester class, at least. There's a, a wonderful teacher of voice in Miami. Uh, I hear occasionally about somebody. But I want to leave you with one point that came out of teaching this on a constant basis. There are people who suggest that uh, women to be convincing, should lower their voice and be more, the idea, I guess, is to be more like a man. There's two things terribly wrong with that. Uh, the first thing is the voice will not accommodate that. And my daughter, Lisa, I'm indebted to her for her presentation on this. The vocal cords weren't even meant for speech in the beginning. They're very delicate. And that's why, you know, a tenor cannot be told to be a bass in an opera. They make slight adjustments over the years, but they don't go from this to that. It's not, but the second one is even more important. You have to be yourself in court. You have to be yourself. You have to have your style. You have to be your person. Uh, you can't be someone else. You can borrow techniques from someone else, but you cannot be someone else. And uh, I, I throw that out there to show the need, again, for every law school to have a class on voice. When you, uh, the last point I'll make on this is you turn on the TV and the anchor people, men and women, are authoritative. Leslie Stahl is on 60 Minutes. She's, every word is as clear as it can be. You understand exactly what Leslie Stahl is saying and you wanna hear more of it. Corporate America acquires those people with those voices and makes them anchor people and makes them people doing ads and all of that. And here we have all these lawyers who basically have never thought about it. And so, um, as I said, I apologize because I, I fixated on this because I had a student who had a terrible voice 35 years ago. And I, did, I, I made no suggestion. I didn't know anything. I, what am I going to say? You have a terrible voice? What am I going to say? And then I got some books and I read and I tried to teach myself. Tremendous, tremendous advice all around. Jim, we could go on for many more hours. You have so much wisdom to, to share. Our time is up, though. So let, us, let me thank you on behalf of Natalie and Jean and Sarah and the Will Work for Food Project. This is a tremendous presentation. We hope that people will contribute to the Alameda County Community Food Bank. I in, hope they will. In your honor. Yeah. And I think Natalie has just posted the information again in the chat. It's www.accfb.org. That's www.accfb.org. Jim Brosnahan, thank you so much. And with that, very nice to be we, with you all. Thank you. We we are complete. Thank you.